Hi, welcome to VNN. Did you know that in Canada, it is estimated that uh, fertility issues affect roughly one in six individuals? And uh, those Canadians who want to start a family, uh, the financial and mental pressures are so immense, they are almost unbearable. And uh, there is very little government funding available. We have with us today a uh, reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist, uh, Dr. Prati Sharma, who is also an officer of the board of the Fertility Friends Foundation, who will give us an insight the, into this uh, pressing issue. Welcome to VNN, Dr. Sharma. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me on this outlet to discuss what, as you said, is an increasingly prevalent issue that affects one in six Canadians. Um, and access to high quality fertility care is tricky. And in an ideal world, we want everyone who needs this tr these types of treatments to have it available to them without becoming financially essentially unstable. So tell us something about the, uh, the Fertility Friends Foundation that you're involved with. Yes. So Fertility Friends is a registered Canadian charity um, that provides grants to patients who are undergoing fertility treatment, including egg donation, sperm donation, IVF, and gestational surrogacy. And so we know that fertility treatments are costly, that patients often need more than one cycle to achieve their pregnancy, and the costs of these types of cycles can add up. And the data actually shows that sometimes patients are spending nearly their household income to have a baby. And so what we do is um, a couple times a year, we entertain applications from patients who are undergoing fertility treatment and requests to apply for our grants, and we assess them in terms of medical and financial need, and we provide grants currently of about four to $5,000 each to help support the cost of these treatments. And to date now, we've granted uh, 13 applicants grants of approximately four to $5,000 each, each, and patients are just immensely grateful for even a small amount of support in their journeys. And uh, when was this set up, uh, this foundation? Yeah, it's relatively new. It's really one of a kind in that there are only very few organizations like this in Ontario. And so it's only less than a year old. Um, we achieved our charity status last year. We've had uh, two to three grant applications. Our current grant application is open. And we, over the course of the year, have had various fundraising events. We're actually doing a run this weekend to raise funds. We have had various social media and online um, fundraisers. And yeah, we're really in a growth phase to try to raise awareness, support patients, and also raise funds to help uh, give out more grants to patients who need them. Yes. Uh, what is the science behind these uh, fertility treatments? Is there an age factor involved? I mean, is a limit to age and it should be below 35 or not, uh, not be above 40? Yeah. Yeah. Like so age is certainly one of the biggest predictors of fertility and probably the most common reason that patients come to a fertility clinic because they're older and they can't conceive. But it's one of the factors that are related to infertility. So when a client comes to me, a patient comes to me for an evaluation of fertility, I'm kind of looking at four or five different things. One is the age factor. And we know that as women age and they get older over the age of 40, particularly over the age of 35, 37, and even more so over the age of 40, their egg quality or their egg number and their egg reserve declines. And so as women get older, it becomes more difficult to conceive and their need for more aggressive treatments increases. But that's one factor. There's also anatomic factors to make sure the anatomy of the reproductive tract is normal, the tubes are open, the uterus looks normal, there's no endometriosis or scar tissue, there's male factors, so we always check the sperm, the count, the motility, the quality of the sperm, hormonal factors like thyroid and prolactin, um, and so all of these things can contribute to infertility. Sometimes the diagnosis is unexplained and you just can't find a reason. And those uh, diagnoses are also treatable with various fertility treatment methods. And what does this uh, gestational carrier mean? Is it uh, surrogacy? Correct. So gestational carrier is another 
technical term for surrogacy. And so when does a patient need a surrogate? Well, there are many reasons um, a couple or a patient can need a gestational surrogate, whether it's anatomic, whether it's recurrent miscarriages, whether it's having a medical problem that prevents them from carrying a successful pregnancy to term. And so we're really lucky in North America that there are women who out of the kindness of their heart and altruistically are willing to carry a baby for someone else in order to help them build a family. And so that process is a little bit complicated and it's very expensive, but it's very rewarding to us as fertility doctors. And it allows these patients who may not be able to carry on their own to be able to achieve a pregnancy and build a family by potentially doing IVF with their own eggs or with an egg donor, creating embryos and then putting those embryos into a surrogate to carry the pregnancy for them. I mean, uh, sometimes uh, does this create any legal and emotional problems with the yeah. mother? I mean, how do you tackle that? Yeah, it's a tricky issue. And I think first and foremost, the individual or the couple that's proceeding with gestational surrogacy has to be very comfortable with the fact that someone else will be carrying their child. Now, I will tell you from doing this for 10, 12 years, the patients do, that do go ahead with gestational surrogacy really bond with the surrogate. The surrogate almost becomes part of their family. But yes, it is a different mode of conception. And so we do say that both the intended parents and the gestational surrogate need to have good counseling. They both see a counselor to make sure they're comfortable with all aspects of this. And there needs to be a legal document saying yes. basically the surrogate's role is just to carry the pregnancy, but the biological mother is the intended parent. So yes, we have lots of checks and balances to ensure everyone is comfortable and that legally we're in the right space, that the surrogate has had full medical clearance to make sure that she's going to be a successful candidate. But once all of that's said and done, most of these relationships actually end up being really wonderful. And the surrogate is just a part of the family that's helped sort of build and create this family structure. Is there a lot of money uh, involved in this affair? There is, isn't it? Yes. So a surrogacy cycle is upwards of $100,000 in Canada. But to be quite honest, it's cheaper in Canada than some of the other places like the United States. And that's because egg donors and gestational surrogates in Canada can't be paid for giving out their gametes, their eggs or their uterus for use. They are just paid for their expenses in the process. And so it is actually less expensive in Canada than it is elsewhere. However, $100,000 is a lot of money for a surrogate or $25,000, $35,000 for egg donation. And so this is why foundations like Fertility Friends exist because we want to try to mitigate those costs for patients a little bit because unfortunately, OHIP does not cover these processes. Some people do have private insurance that will cover medication or maybe some of this process. Um, Third-party insurance providers are slowly coming in, but most of this fee is on the patient to cover. And as you can see, that kind of financial burden is pretty high. So anything we can do to help ease the patient's financial concerns by giving grants is, you know, something to help. But I mean, most of the treatments are not with surrogates. It is, it's within... No, within no, no, no. I mean, surrogacy comprises probably a small proportion of the patients that come to the infertility clinic. However, doing in vitro fertilization or IVF um, with all of the add-ons like genetic testing and the drugs and potentially patients being older and needing multiple egg retrievals, that is a common scenario of what I see in my practice. And so let's say a 38, 39-year-old needs two IVF cycles with genetic testing, that could be $30,000, $40,000. And that's also quite expensive, right? And that's the bread and butter of what we see. And so those are the kinds of patients that require our help. You mentioned that there are studies have been found that uh, nearly half of this IVF uh, cycles in Ontario are privately funded. Is that Correct. from their personal income? Yes. So uh, in Ontario, there is a public funding program called the OFP, and that allows women who are under 43 to be able to do an IVF cycle with their own eggs. But that only covers the IVF process. It does not cover the medication, which can be upwards of three, four, five thousand dollars. It does not cover genetic testing of the embryos, which is four to seven thousand dollars. So yes, it offers some funds, but it only covers one cycle. It has age limits, and it does not cover everything. And so while it's wonderful, it doesn't necessarily cover everything a patient needs. There are also long wait lists for public funding because the funding that's given out 
to each clinic does not cover all the patients that need an IVF cycle in that year. And so if you have a 39, 40, 41 year old who needs to do IVF very soon because she's older, but she can't get a funded cycle for six months, she's faced with the possibility of paying the whole entire 20,000 out of pocket. And does this uh, IVF mm -hmm. treatments also cover say the freezing of eggs for future use and freezing of sperm for future use? Yeah, it's a great question. So that's a big buzzword, fertility preservation, egg and embryo freezing, sperm freezing, if you're not ready to conceive now. Unfortunately, the public funding program does not cover egg or embryo or sperm freezing unless you have a diagnosis or undergoing treatment that can really compromise your fertility. So let's say for a cancer patient who's undergoing chemotherapy, she will be funded by the government to do an IVF cycle to freeze eggs or embryos. But unfortunately for just the run of the mill 35 year old who doesn't have a partner and wants to freeze her eggs for later use, that is also going to be a $10,000 endeavor. And so again, quite expensive if you're a solo person trying to pay for fertility treatment. What about um, a single man or single woman who wanted uh, children? I mean, do, do you help in that too? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, along the lines of the fact that patients and people are waiting longer to get into relationships and with the advent of reproductive technologies, men and women who want to have a family potentially without a partner come to me saying, okay, well, I'm a single woman. How can I conceive? And so sperm donation and egg donation and surrogacy for a single male, those are all things that we can make happen. And so for single women who come to me, depending on their characteristics, we consider insemination with donor sperm, or if they need IVF with donor sperm, we do that as well. For single men or same-sex men that come to me and want to build a family, they use an egg donor and a surrogate to create their family. What activities have, does the foundation have I mean, throughout the year? You plan things? Yes. So... This year and this weekend specifically, because it is Canadian Fertility Awareness Week, we've been highly active on social media, we've been on various news outlets, much like yours, to talk about the foundation and raise awareness. This weekend, this Saturday, we're doing a run where we have many, I think we're up to like 20 plus teams running um, in celebration of Canadian fertility, and we've raised, I think, over $25,000 already, and we hope to raise more by Saturday. We are looking at a potential gala in the next six months to raise funds. Um, we have lots of, you know, online um, so, uh, platforms where we raise awareness and raise money. And our goal is actually to give out more grants this year than we did last year. And so we're really excited about the possibilities. When you cover the costs of this assisted reproduction, I mean, does it involve the legal costs and uh, fertility yeah. costs, everything? Or I mean, everything adds up. As I was just telling a patient today, coming in and doing the fertility treatment in the clinic is the medical aspect. But especially if you're considering donor eggs, donor sperm, or a surrogate, you need good legal agreements. And so reproductive lawyers are essential in the process, but they also have their own fees. And so that can be anywhere from five, six, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000. So that is another add on to the cost. So when we give out grants at Fertility Friends, we don't specify that those grants have to go only towards your medication or only towards your treatment. At present, when we give these grants to patients, it can be applied towards whatever piece of the treatment they need. If they need it for their legal fees, fine. If they need it for their medications, that's fine. If they need it for their IVF, that's fine too. It's really just to help them pay for the entire process. This is 2023 and you think there is still some stigma surrounding this uh, infertility treatment? <laughs> You know, things are changing, thankfully, and we're really speaking out loud and talking about infertility. And so I myself, in my own practice, I'm amazed at seeing how people are much more open to talk about their story, their journeys, the fact that they're going through this and helping others. But you're right, it's a very personal issue. And I think when women and men think about starting a family, it's sort of an innate right and people feel like it should happen for everyone. And if it doesn't, there's a certain feeling of shame and it's still kind of very natural that you go to a party and someone says, oh, well, when are you gonna have kids? And that can be very hard on someone who's struggling with infertility. So 
things are changing and people are talking about it, but I think, you know, we have a fair ways to go. And I think that's where foundations like Fertility Friends, um, I think our ability to support patients mentally, physically, and financially going through the process and really speaking out loud about this um, issue and making it normalized, I, I think that's where we're really helping people. And that's our goal. I think you should need, you need to have some educational programs. Uh, yeah, and we do. So part of Fertility Friends is not just money and raising funds, but we also put on webinars and live events. Um, we have experts come and speak online um, and, and really just educate and empower patients to have knowledge about their own treatment so they can advocate for themselves and also for their caregivers and friends and relatives to understand what this is all about and sort of be supportive through the process. Is there a special clinic clinic or hospital where uh, these patients come? Yes. So yes. in order to proceed with fertility treatment or even to have an evaluation, you want to see a fertility specialist that has good training, who understands how to do this. And you want to be in a clinic that has a stellar IVF laboratory. They're used to doing this. They know how to make people pregnant. I mean, I can speak for myself. I've undergone seven years of training. So I did a four-year OBGYN residency and a three-year subspecialty in reproductive medicine and infertility. And so in order to have that designation, you have to be licensed to practice this kind of fertility care and do egg retrievals and stimulate patients, ovarian stimulation, egg donation, surrogacy. So, uh, you know, there are people out there who sort of practice low level fertility care who are not reproductive endocrinologists. But my advice would be for patients out there that they should see someone who specializes in reproductive medicine in order to get the best success rates and go to a clinic that has the best rates. And these clinics are in the hospitals in Brampton? No. Mississauga, no one. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's clinics all over the GTA. Certainly, they're concentrated in downtown Toronto, but there's lots of clinics outside as well. And, you know, with the advent of telemedicine, we're able to see consults remotely, just like I'm talking to you. And so even if you live further out, even if you're further out than the suburbs, I see patients overseas and whatnot all the time by telemedicine. Patients can get local testing if they need and we can minimize their visits to the clinic but yes patients do need to come to the main center in order to do their egg retrieval and their IUIs and things like that um, but in answer to your question most fertility centers are not located in hospitals they're freestanding units um, we have um, out of hospital premises operating rooms where we can do our procedures right in our offices um, we give conscious sedation for most of the procedures that we do, but they are freestanding. They're outside of a hospital. Um, and, you know, it, we have all the abilities to do procedures, to do labs that come back the same day. You know, it's considered an outpatient specialty. And does something in Ontario say OHIP doesn't cover this uh, treatment? So what OHIP covers is your consultation okay. and your follow-up appointments. It covers some of the monitoring for certain lower level cycles. Um, some of the specialized fertility tests that we do for miscarriage or for ovarian reserve, those will be paid out of pocket, but you're able to have your first initial consultation for free. Some of the diagnostic testing is covered. The anatomic check, the semen analysis, routine conventional blood work like hormonal testing and STD testing. But when it comes to treatment and medication fertility drugs, some people have coverage for medication, some people don't. And when it comes to IVF, for the most part, patients are paying out of pocket unless they have supplemental insurance for drugs or potentially for fertility coverage or a flexible health spending account. And so if, for a patient, will you be looking at from, from the time of conception to final delivery? So, I mean, the fertility doctor's role is assisting with conception, so the preconception phase, and usually until anywhere between 8 to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. So for the average patient, I would say that it takes anywhere between three months and a year to actually conceive, depending on how their treatment goes. On average, it's probably four to six months because patients try less conservative, like more conservative therapies, and then they move on as needed to IVF, so on and so forth. Once they get pregnant, in my practice, they stay with me till 12 weeks, typically. And then after that first trimester, they go on to their obstetrician or midwife who takes care of them for the next six months. Okay. Are you pressing for, say, increasing increased government funding? 
Yes. I mean, I, I think, you know, it's interesting. The WHO just published a study showing the global prevalence of infertility. And one of their big mission statements in that report was that we just need increased funding and increased policies geared towards infertility because it's so common. So one of the ways that we are looking at this in Ontario is to sort of rally support in the fertility arena to raise the amount of money that's given out for public funding to potentially cover additional things like elective egg freezing. Um, just because right now what we have is decent, but we could do better and patients could be covered for maybe more than one cycle or be able to get their funded IVF cycle within three months of wanting to use it rather than be on a two-year wait list. Um, there's lots of clinics in Ontario who actually don't receive funding. It's newer clinics that aren't getting funding because only the established clinics are getting funding. But what if a patient chooses to go to a newer clinic? They should be allowed to take their funded cycle there. So that's a, there's lots of avenues for improvement where we can advocate for our patients and coverage. Any provincial MPPs or MPs uh, helping you in this regard? Yes. Yeah. Look, I think awareness is increasing. I mean, I recently did an ev event for endometriosis awareness where an MPP from um, one of the local areas came and was advocating for the fact that endometriosis patients should be considered like cancer patients and they should also get coverage for their IVF. So the word is out there. And I think uh, the political powers that be are actually interested in helping. Um, there is a national patient advocacy uh, organization called Fertility Matters Canada, and they're really gaining steam in terms of liaisoning with government relations to sort of help increase funding. Um, so the ball is really rolling, I think, and hopefully we're just looking at an upwards trajectory and a hopeful future where all fertilities treatment is covered for patients who need it. I mean, is there a particular reason that why this infertility is sort of increasing in Canada? I mean, is it Yeah. Is it, well, I don't think it's I don't think it's isolated to Canada. I think it's really worldwide the prevalence is increasing. And I think a lot of it is the fact that women are delaying childbearing and they're delaying childbearing because they're pursuing other career goals. They are waiting to meet the right person. They are pursuing education and careers. They want to travel before they have children, whatever it is. I mean, the data actually shows that women are conceiving their first child at a later age than historically they were. Um, and that in and of itself, the age-related fertility map is just changing. Hopefully more women are thinking about freezing their eggs sooner so that they sort of defy the odds of becoming infertile later. But I think this is a real big piece of it. And I think as women delay their fertility, they need more aggressive treatment. More people need donor eggs because they're uh, getting pregnant later in life. More people need to freeze their eggs and thus the cost of all of these treatments increases. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. I mean, how... How does how do people have, uh, contact you? I mean, is there an office for Fertility Friends Foundation? So Fertility Friends Foundation has a website and we're also online social media. You can go to www.fertilityfriendsfoundation.com. Www, There's a link to donate now if you'd like to donate and help patients. You can click apply now if you'd like to apply for a grant. As I said, our grant application platform is now open. In terms of reaching out to me, if you're interested in a fertility evaluation and to become a patient, um, I work at Create Fertility Center. You can look me up at www.createivf.com. I'm also on social media. If you find me on Instagram at drprati, Prati A. Sharma, um, it's pretty easy to find me because I have a, a pretty good social media presence. Um, and I'm always looking and willing to take on new patients. I have a particular love for the South Asian community being part of it myself. Um, and I understand, you know, how hard it is when people ask you, when are you having children? When are you having children? So that's, you know, my goal to help patients build their families. When the surrogacy takes place, is it mainly done in Canada or people go outside to the U.S.? or? I, I mean, Depends. using a gestational surrogate, you can do that very easily in Canada. At Create, we're one of the largest clinics that um, practices third-party reproduction. So um, I would suggest for those patients that need a surrogate to go to a clinic that specializes in it, like Create. We have um, communications and liaisons with lots of Canadian agencies, and there are actually lots of Canadian surrogates out there. I think that's a common 
um, misunderstanding that patients think that if they need a gestational surrogate, they need to leave Canada to do this process. But that's absolutely not true. You can use donor eggs. You can use a gestational surrogate in Canada. And so, you know, see a fertility doctor, educate yourself, learn more about how you can do this. But, you know, like anywhere else, even in the U.S., the wait time to find an egg donor and surrogate is like present it's it takes about six to 12 months to match with a surrogate so certainly if you're willing to pay more you might match with a surrogate a couple of months sooner in the U.S. but it is going to be much more costly and that's really changing in Canada there's so many more agencies so many surrogates out there and egg donors um, egg banks are starting to be a real thing where we have frozen donor eggs available ready to go and so I would suggest for any patients out there who are interested in egg donation and surrogacy see a Toronto fertility doctor like myself and create, and we can really help you consider this process in Canada at a lower cost with many equal success rate. I don't think many people know about the surrogacy availability in Canada. So I've never yeah. heard. So, very yeah. Good. Yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you, Dr. Sharma. I think thank you. It was an absolute was pleasure to speak to you and be part of your uh, outlet. And I look forward to seeing the presentation. And because you have given quite a good insight into uh, what's happening in this uh, field. And uh, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you.